might turn with me in your Bibles to the book of uh, Matthew, and then I'll go to the book of uh, 2 Timothy and Matthew 28. You know this by heart, but I'll go ahead and read it, because sometimes we forget it. Matthew 28, New King James, verse 18. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore. That's out of his authority. He says that. It's a command. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy and the Father and of the Holy Spirit. The Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age, the Great Commission. I'm really glad to be here. Uh, you couldn't have read a more appropriate verse than you read uh, a moment ago to um, raise up successors. Uh, the, the, there's so much I'd like to say, and, and the worship service is so good that it inspires me to preach more than I planned, and uh, I'm trying to restrain myself of so many thoughts. You know, in the Lord's presence, a lot of things come to mind. And um, anyway, I appreciate this church. 
I have for many, many years. My first visit here was in 79 and every year since. So, but 1979, just to make that clear. <laughs> um, anyway, I, uh, I've gotten attached to old jokes. Um, I just went out there. Was that my lung or was that? All right. And I, uh, um, <laughs> we just had Thanksgiving. A, a couple invited an elderly man who didn't have a family and sat him at the table for Thanksgiving and he sat him next to the turkey and he said it's, it's a, a great honor to be sitting next to the turkey. Realizing he was sitting next to his hostess, he, 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 he said, I meant the one on the table. Uh, so I, some things you can't get back. <laughs> my, my. I got a lot of old, I don't know why, but I fell in love with old folks. I mean, you know, we need to laugh more. Children, little children laugh. I don't know how many times a day, 40 or something like that. And the older you get, you laugh less. So we need to laugh. Bring us back to our childhood. <laughs> my, my. Time is a great healer, but a lousy beautician. <laughs> and, um, we, uh, we, we got here because People in our past were faithful to reproduce. I'm going to talk about preparing successors. Um, if you're young, you may feel it's irrelevant. <clears throat> I don't think so. I wish I had thought of it when I was younger. Um, there's a saying that when you're young, it's about success. When you're old, it's about successors. And I really know that to be true. The question is, who will receive your treasures? Who will receive what you gave your life for? And what will they do with it? Um, I won't read, but in Ecclesiastes, uh, we believe written by Solomon <clears throat> in the second chapter, he's talking about the vanity of life. You don't find a lot of inspiration in Ecclesiastes, but you do find a lot of wisdom. And he says one of the vanities is that you work all your life and the possibility is you might hand your heritage and legacy over to a fool or to somebody who never worked for it and doesn't treasure it and does foolish things with it. As wise as Solomon was, that's exactly what he did. He gave it to Rehoboam who promptly lost 10 out of 12 tribes. Preparing someone to receive what is important to you is vital. Providing for your successors is not preparing for your successors. There is a difference. In our nation, we've been so anxious to prepare that is provide to, to give our children something we didn't have that we often fail to give them what we did have. We really need to focus on our successors, not just our success. Jesus left when he was 33 and a half, so he wasn't what we call old. But at the moment of his anointing, he began to prepare successors. And we, we have to believe that he did the best job anyone's ever done, being perfect and 
following the Holy Spirit. And the people he chose, I doubt that we would choose. He went into what Ma uh, Matthew 4 calls Galilee of the Gentiles, those who walk in darkness. It was a mixed area. Ahab and Jezebel had reigned there. And other evil kings, the Syrians, had assaulted, and it was a mixed area, not so religious. Baal worship had been prominent there, a lot of problems. And Jesus went there with his ministry, and there he chose most all of his disciples, with the exception of Judas, who was his betrayer. And uh, people like Peter, who told Jesus, get out of my boat, I'm a sinful man. Or people like Matthew, who was a tax collector and hated by the people collecting tax for Rome. Uh, each of the guys, the religious zealot, they were not great candidates to change the world, even to be changed. But Jesus trained them. We need to take a new look at how he trained them, how he prepared them to be his successors in the most important event in history and the most important treasure in all of history, how they could take the good news to the world. He didn't simply do it by recommending them to a seminary. He didn't just simply say, you need your bachelor's degree if you're going to be in the ministry. And I'm, I'm for all of that, but it is a, it is a pitiful substitute for the, for the school of life, which Jesus shared with his disciples. He lived with them. He, somebody, somebody said concerning children, don't worry that they don't listen. Worry that they watch. And the disciples didn't always listen to Jesus in terms of agreeing with what he said, even up until the end. But they always watched. They saw things that no one had ever seen, certainly that they had never seen. These guys are the most base, hardworking Blue collar guys, Peter could curse after being with Jesus three and a half years. He could cut a man's head off after prayer meeting. This is a guy who is, well, anyway, I have relatives like that. Now, <laughs> that, that, we, we need to understand that Jesus is showing us something, that we need to learn that when he lays his hand on somebody, they can become a world changer. They can go from darkness to light. They can go from weakness to strength. They can go from cowardice to courage. We, we need this kind of faith as, as we get out into the world and we see the world. We need to see it through different eyes. We need to see it in the, in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's how he saw it. All things are possible to those that believe and he looked at candidates that way. He looked at you that way. He looked at me that way. We need to look at others that way. Somebody say amen. My goodness alive. I, I'll get to preaching if I'm not careful. But we, 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 the, the biggest challenge we have is to get the church out of the church. And I love the church. Love this church. We, uh, we have a tremendous challenge. I don't believe it's too late, but it is late. And that is to begin to focus on who is going to take the baton. Who's going to get the mantle? We need to be looking for them because they're around us. They're in front of us. They may be in our family. Jesus prepared successors. Say it with me. Jesus, let's say it with gusto. Jesus prepared successors. 
and he prepared successful successors. The Apostle Paul said to Timothy, he said, my true son. He didn't say the member of my church. He said, my true son. He says it several times in those two epistles. And he said, teach faithful men who will teach others also. There are four, in, there are four generations in that verse. Paul, Timothy, faithful men, others also. He was anticipating that what they had received would go throughout all generations. God told Abraham, this, that's not a new idea in Jesus' day. God told Abraham that he would bless all the nations of the earth. And all the, the generations that were to come, that theme is, is registered throughout the Old Testament. And that's why we have it is because it's a pass it on kind of faith. If we don't pass it on, we're violating the command of the Lord. We think, okay, this is a bad, this is a bad violation. That's a bad violation. I could go down the list, but I don't want to name anybody's problems, including mine. What's the worst violation? The failure to prepare successors. You say, but I don't smoke, I don't drink, I don't go with those who do. I'm not advocating that you do any of that, but I'm saying this, there's a greater violation that the church has committed on a personal level. I, I can't think of any time I got in more trouble than the word discipleship. There are people still mad at me because I believed in making disciples and didn't always do it right. You know, it's one thing to teach something. It's another thing to practice it. That's why I hate preaching, because <laughs> I, I'll never preach on patience again. You know, let me tell you something. You get tested. You can preach on healing, but you better be ready to pray for the sick, because they're going to come. You can, you can preach on casting out in evil spirits, but you better be ready to do it because they're going to come. And you can talk about, we need to make disciples, but you better be ready to do it because they're going to show up. And you're never going to do it perfect. Only Jesus did. But if you don't do it, we have violated the command of our Lord who has all authority. Paul prepared successors. The apostles prepared successors. They taught faithful people. And faithfulness is not simply just being regular in church attendance. It's being faithful to what God said to do. Thank God for those that are faithful in church. But there's some other things the Lord said us to do between meetings. In Psalm 78, he talks about parenting. Thank God for parents. Thank God for good parents. I, I, it's our first school. It's, it's so fundamental. Uh, I had good parents. I'm grateful to God. They uh, gave me to God when I was born and gave me to God again when I was 17. Anyway, <laughs> I, uh, I appreciate my parents. I love them. Um, and uh, wouldn't, anyway. Parenting is a gift. Children are a gift from the Lord. Trouble comes when the link between generations fails and is broken. And when they inherit something other than what brought them into the world and into the life. When the link is broken. Some call it a generation gap, but too often it's more than a gap. It's a bridge that's out. Um, as I said earlier, providing is not preparing. It's important. Leadership, leadership is a trust from God. It's a gift, whether it's parental leadership, church leadership, school leadership. 
business leadership. It's a trust. The Bible says in Psalm 75 that God promotes one and puts another down or puts one down and puts another up. Leadership is a gift. Ephesians 4 said apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers are gifts. I believe all leadership, business leadership, is a gift. It, you say, but I earned it. Well, perhaps. But it's a gift. It's because of gifts, innate genetic gifts, spiritual gifts that we're able, thank God, thank God, Brother Luke, for the freedom we have in this culture. We're gifted. Where did we get it? Well, we got it from the Lord. We got it from our predecessors. But we're not here because we earned it. We're here because it was given to us. Please never forget it. There's blood on battlefields that got us here. We're here by the grace of God. Now, that's a gift. Grace is a gift. We become accountable for our stewardship of our gifts. I don't care what you do, you owe it to somebody. My father believed in work. I believed in my working, too. He got personal. <laughs> and um, I had chores. It's a bad word. <laughs> and uh, my chore, one of my chores was pulling down the shades when it got uh, lighter inside than it was outside, the shades come down. Shades back then were uh, inconsistent. They sometimes you'd pull them down and walk away, and you'd hear flap, 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 and you'd come back up <laughs> all on its own. And um, I got in a lot of trouble over shades. <laughs> sometimes uh, at the chair, right at the foot of the shades. Anyway. As I bent over, the, the, yeah, I, I, my dad did not like it to be lighter inside than it was outside. And I, I'm kind of that way now myself. And then he told me to get a job when I was nine. He said, if you don't, I, I'll take your allowance away. I don't know if I was even getting an allowance. but <laughs> So uh, I got a job sweeping rooms at school. And... Um, Paid six cents a room. And some of my friends were doing the same thing, and they struck for seven cents. And <laughs> we all got fired. And uh, I was out of work when I was 10 years old. <laughs> and uh, my father again said, if you don't find something to do, uh, you'll lose your allowance. So I went to work when I was 11. And um, working in a store, and um, the guy told me he'd pay me three dollars on Saturday for work, and he paid me two forty. And I confronted him about it, and he said, "Well, I had to take out sixty cents for Social Security and income tax." And I learned to hate the government when I was eleven years old. <laughs> um, But um, anyway, work. I didn't realize at the time, but it was a gift that my parents thought I should work. And I found out that when you work, no matter what field, it helps if you're mentored or apprenticed, we call it. I call it discipleship, but anyway. We all benefit. I, I was cutting meat when I was 13 <clears throat> years old, butchering, and um, I learned from somebody who could butcher. And um, I cut myself a few times. I still have a scar, too. Uh, but uh, I learned, and he taught me, um, and he fussed at me. Um, I was driving a truck, too, when I was 13. I never had a mentor in that, and I have a record to prove it. Um, but, but you learn from somebody. 
I don't care what business you go into. You go to the manager and he assigns you. And most of the time he'll say, this guy will teach you. And he probably realizes you're going to be his successor. You don't, you're not thinking about his point of view. You're thinking, I'm going to get the job. But he's training you to take his job, usually. Hopefully he'll get a better job. But he's preparing his successor. We all are. We don't always know it. We don't always do it well. But it's always helpful if you are looking around you for who wants to know what you have to say and to do. We need desperately. Not just to think about success, but succession. Who's going to do what you do? Who's going to lead worship after you? Who's going to do your job? And what will they do with what you give them? It's a serious question. We are facing it in our nation. And by the way, if we don't pay attention, like Rehoboam, they'll do the wrong thing with it. I pray for our leaders. I, I trust that you do as well. I... Uh, We'll say this, there will come a time, ready or not, when leadership will be transferred. There will come a time. Uh, the child you hold will one day hold you. If you remember that, you'll pay attention to that child. My mother passed away. My father lived with me. Fortunately, he was a blessing. My wife passed away. I lived with my son. Fortunately, um, he and his wife were kind to me. But I'm no longer the head of the house. That's an adjustment. When you're living in somebody else's house, you don't tell everybody what to do. Well, you may try. <laughs> I don't have time to go into all that and don't want to. But <laughs> Somebody says, when, when will you retire? <clears throat> Is that a question or a suggestion? <laughs> Elijah's in the cave. It's dark. He's hurt. He's mad. Jezebel trying to kill him. He thinks he's the only prophet. And the Lord finally says, come on out of there. And he does after there's a wind and a fire and so forth, none of which is God. It's just a lot of commotion. But he finally comes out, and the Lord says, I've got a job for you. I want you to anoint a king. I want you to anoint a prophet. Your work's not finished. And sometimes in old age, it's easy to get in a cave. It's easy to uh, get where Solomon was, vanity. But we have a job. And so he goes out on a farm and casts his mantle over a guy plowing. And Elisha knew what that meant. He said, let me go home. Say goodbye to my parents. Kill the ox and had a going away party and 
joined Elisha, Elijah. My first sermon was on Elijah. I love Elijah. And uh, he follows him around. And Elijah kept saying, stay here. I'm going somewhere. He said, as sure as you live, I'm not leaving you. I'm staying with you. And he did till he crossed over the river. There were a lot of prophets and sons of the prophets over there, but none of them was walking with Elijah. They might have prophesied, but they didn't get to Mantle. Elijah said, if you see me when I go, if you're there with me and God opens your eyes, you'll get to Mantle. And uh, sure enough, it's got to be a special moment. The old prophet, ready to leave, and um, Elisha's looking, his eyeballs look like two fried eggs. He's looking. He wants to see him when he goes. There's something special about seeing somebody when they go. And um, the mantle came drifting down, and he grabbed it and hit the water. Where's the Lord God of Elijah? That's, a, that's, that's what I want to ask. Where's my daddy's God? My father, my grandfather, spiritual fathers. Where's Spurgeon's God? Where's Paul's God? Where are you, Lord? Do it again. Do it again. I know you're still there. Let me catch their mantle somehow. Preparation is purpose, and purpose is power. Preparing successors ought to be a primary purpose. Successors are our crown. There's nothing that brings more joy in the departing days than to look back and, and to know there are stewards ready. What I gave my life for, what I believe will be well cared for. I think that's the greatest blessing that an old person could know. God has to anoint our eyes to see those who can be that? Who will you trust? To whom will you entrust what God's given you? They're there. Don't die without seeing them, knowing them, sharing your life with them. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the gifts. There's so many. We thank you, Father, for loving us before we loved you, choosing us before we chose you. We're so blessed. Most blessed nation that ever walked the face of the earth. Liberty is such a sweet blessing. Lord, help us not to take it all for granted. And turn to some successor, ill-prepared, never having worked for it, not knowing what to do with it, and from eternity gazing down, see it squandered and falling apart. 
while we have breath, help us to be faithful. Thank you for those who were and gave us an opportunity. May we be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. Walking around these walls I thought by now they'd fall But you have never failed me Change to come, knowing the battles won. For you have never failed me. Thank you, Lord. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Your faith. This is my confidence, you never